At this point, I assume you've already looked at the mitosis video, and what we want to do here is look at the other process of cell division in eukaryotic organisms, and this is called meiosis, and along with that, of course, we'll see some cytokinesis going on. Meiosis is involved in making what we call sex cells, uh, or gametes, namely the egg and the sperm in animals, and it's important to understand meiosis because when we get to genetics, what happens in genetics in terms of the sorts of patterns that we see relate directly to what's going on in meiosis. So let's take a look at some of the key things. First of all, some terminology that you need to know. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in lab. First of all, homologous chromosomes. These are chromosomes that are the same size and shape and have corresponding genes in the same positions or spots along the chromosome. Diploid. Diploid cells have two of each kind of homologous chromosomes. So for example, humans usually have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 pairs of strictly homologous chromosomes, plus the so-called sex chromosomes. Another term is haploid. And those are cells that have one of each type of chromosome based on size and shape. Gametes, for example. Uh, in humans, gametes have 23 chromosomes instead of 46. And then, of course, we have from earlier the concept of an unduplicated chromosome, which has one molecule of DNA, and a duplicated chromosome, where you have two molecules of DNA per chromosome. We talked about this in the mitosis video. So let's look at diploid versus haploid just a little bit because that tends to confuse people. On the left-hand side here, I have uh, my cell example that had four chromosomes. These are meant to represent two ways you can have diploid cells in this situation. Here I've got a big pair that are homologous to each other. They're the same size and shape. But notice that the individual chromosomes are duplicated chromosomes. I have a small pair. Again, these are homologous to each other, but the chromosomes are duplicated chromosomes. This is diploid, as is this one down here. Here I have a pair of my big ones, but the chromosomes themselves are unduplicated. Same thing for this other pair here. So in both of these situations, these represent diploid cells. An analogous sort of thing goes on with haploid cells. In a haploid cell, for my example, I have a big chromosome and the smaller chromosome. These two chromosomes are not homologous. Same thing over here. All right, so be careful not to confuse diploid and haploid with each other, and don't confuse them with duplicated versus unduplicated chromosomes. Before mitosis or meiosis, remember that you have to duplicate the DNA in each chromosome so that the resulting cells from this process will have all the DNA they need to survive. Meiosis has two cell divisions. There's meiosis 1, and notice it has a prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1, and usually there's cytokinesis going along with this, but not necessarily. Then meiosis 2, prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2, and cytokinesis. The result when you're all done is four haploid cells, and those in animals at any rate will become the gametes, the egg and the sperm. So let's look first of all at prophase 1. Prophase 1 starts out looking like prophase of mitosis, but the next thing that happens here that's different is that, or the first thing that happens that's different, is that homologous chromosomes pair up side by side. Now, the reason they do that is because they're going to swap pieces of DNA, of corresponding pieces of DNA. And that process of swapping the DNA is what is referred to as crossing over, and that's illustrated here see what's going on. This particular uh, piece of DNA has exchanged a segment with this one over here. Okay. Now the color, by the way, is significant in my scheme of things. The blue pieces of DNA 
are from have genetic information from the mother. The red pieces of DNA have genetic information from the father. So you can see we've scrambled the DNA a little bit here. So we have new combinations of DNA that did not exist in either parent. There's usually more than one crossover event, but we're just showing one here for simplicity. Now after prophase one, we go to metaphase one. It's a little bit different looking than metaphase of mitosis because the pairs of homologous chromosome line up end to end rather than just the individual chromosomes. I've left out the spindle fibers just for simplicity, but notice I've got the kinetic cores here like we had in mitosis. Now, after metaphase one, we go to anaphase one and observe that the chromosomes that were originally paired up are being separated into two groups. This is a little bit different than anaphase of mitosis because each chromosome is still a duplicated chromosome. Uh, next we go telophase 1 and cytokinesis. So here's at the end of anaphase 1 over here. Here after cytokinesis and telophase 1 we have two daughter cells. Oftentimes the nuclear envelope reforms but not necessarily depending on the organism that you're dealing with. Alright, now what you have here are of course this original cell being diploid. Now the cell is haploid and the cells are no longer genetically identical to each other. So that's the other thing that happens here. And that's partly because of crossing over, but it's also partly because of what happens way back here where you can have two different arrangements of chromosomes back in metaphase one. So you have this arrangement here where the blue chromosomes, for example, are both on the bottom, but by chance they can be flipped around so that one blue one is going this way and one blue one is going the other way. This is a process of what's called, or leads to a process called independent assortment of chromosomes, which is going to be important when we get into genetics. All right, well, what about meiosis two? These two cells after meiosis one then go through another division, which is called meiosis two. Without getting into all the details, it has a prophase two, metaphase two, an anaphase two, a telophase two, and cytokinesis. And I'm going to let you in on a deep dark secret. It's basically the same process as mitosis, except that these two cells are already haploid and the chromosomes aren't strictly genetically identical anymore. It's the same basic process. So this prophase two, metaphase two, these chromosomes lined up end to end. Same thing here. In anaphase 2, the uh, DNA molecules separate like we saw in anaphase of mitosis, so it's a very similar process. So the end result of meiosis 2 is illustrated here. You've got four cells, two from this one and two from this one. Each cell is haploid, each cell has unduplicated chromosomes, and the cells are no longer genetically identical to each other. This is very important when we're thinking about meiosis and, and what happens in sex and the point of having um, gametes that are haploid. All right, the next aspect of uh, sexual reproduction is of course fertilization. So here are our two haploid gametes together, uh, the sperm and the egg. After fertilization, you have a diploid cell which is now what we call the zygote, and this can develop into a multicellular organism. So meiosis is an integral part of sexual reproduction, even though we oftentimes just think about fertilization when we're thinking sexual reproduction. So you're going to have to spend some time going through the stages of meiosis. You might look in your book in uh, chapter 8 and look at the diagrams, but again, concentrate on what's happening with the chromosomes and think to yourself that the chromosomes aren't just moving around willy-nilly, but that that movement is involved in dividing the chromosomes up into different groups. All right, so that's all we've got for meiosis, 
and a little bit later on we'll see how meiosis relates to genetics.